In language, we use similes and metaphors to communicate ideas. We might say somebody moved like lightning or they had a voice that thundered. When we say this, we do not mean that a person was like a large buildup of electrostatic charge discharging or ripping through the atmosphere, or that a person's voice created a region of extremely low pressure resulting in a large volume of air rapidly collapsing to fill the space, the shock waves of which were felt for miles. All we mean when we say somebody moved like lightning is that they were quick, and when a person's voice thunders, it means they spoke in a loud, deep voice. We do something similar with engineering. Often we'll take a system and describe it in terms of an analogy or model. Sometimes we will describe electricity in terms of water flowing through a pipe. The movement of electricity and the movement of water have no physical correlation. How water flows and how electricity flows are very different when we get down to the details. But on another level, they're both governed by three variable linear equations. So there is a similarity. Not too long ago, we learned how to combine series and parallel resistors and conductors. We did this to simplify a complex network of resistors. This allowed us to analyze a circuit more easily. We call this process determining the equivalent resistance or conductance of the network. In the last video, we showed you how a source can be represented in two different ways. A voltage source in series with a resistor can also be represented as a current source in parallel with the same resistor. Since these two representations gave the same exact output in all cases, these two types of circuits are equivalent to each other. So we have the idea of an equivalent resistance and the idea of an equivalent source. What if we could extend this idea to a whole circuit? What if we can take a complex circuit and boil it down to a few equivalent components. The resultant circuit would be much easier to analyze. What was that, John? If we can boil down a circuit to an equivalent circuit, why don't we just build the simple circuit in the first place? Again, what we are doing is circuit modeling. We're not saying the equivalent circuit is the circuit we have. We're saying that for a specific range of operation, the equivalent circuit models a larger circuit. It's kind of like this. If I'm driving a car, there is a correlation between how far I push down the gas pedal and how fast the vehicle moves. So if all I'm interested in is the speed of the vehicle, I do not need to know any of the details of the engine or transmission or any of the other complicated pieces involved in making the car move. To use the car, all I really need to understand is there's a relationship between the displacement of the gas pedal and the speed of the vehicle. So I can come up with a model that relates the displacement of the gas pedal to the speed of the vehicle, and that will give me all the information I need to know to get the car to operate at the desired speed. That does not imply that the gas pedal itself makes the car go faster. The gas pedal actually starts a complicated chain of events in a complicated system. All of the pieces of the complicated system are necessary for the vehicle to work. But unless I'm designing, building, or repairing that system, I don't need to know the details. I just need to know that the gas pedal is also appropriately named the accelerator. With electrical systems, often we are interested in only one aspect of the system's operation, such as input or output resistance, or we are only using the system over a much smaller set of circumstances than the system is capable, for example, an amplifier with a specific DC supply, or maybe the involvement of the whole system is not reasonable to analyze because of inherent uncertainty or complexity. In such cases, we may not need to analyze the whole system. Maybe we can look at a simplified system. Let's take a look at a very simple example, a light bulb. On one level, all we have involved in a circuit for light are the power outlet, a switch, and the light bulb. But if we look into the details, the outlet is a portal to the entire electrical system of the building. Things that happen in other portions of the building can happen have an effect on the light from the bulb. For example, turning on a table saw in the next room. You don't have a table saw in your kitchen? Hmm. Truly, the system does not stop there as the power of the building comes from the electric grid and the events hundreds of miles away can greatly influence how much electricity is available for the building itself. Reaching further electricity is often exchanged between places like Canada and the United States. Now the light bulb system is international. And if I wanted a comprehensive description for the circuit for a light bulb plugged into an outlet in a home, I would actually need to include every electrical device that is connected to the power grid in order to be complete. But not only that, I would need to know the actions of every person or unfortunate squirrel that is interacting with something connected to the power grid. We don't need to do that because for almost every case, the light bulb circuit can be modeled as an AC voltage source, a switch, and a resistor. The basic principle in modeling is that we want the simplest model that works. So if I can model a very complicated system such as the power grid as a couple of components that will still provide the information I need for analyzing my system, then I should use the simple model. A common device used in electrical engineering is the operational 
amplifier. The internal workings of an operational amplifier are fairly complex. There are many components interacting in fairly complex ways. If we had to analyze the internal circuitry of this device every time we wanted to use an operational amplifier, its use in everyday electronics would be much less practical. But, as it turns out, for most uses of an operational amplifier, we can model it with just a few components. In fact, the operational amplifier is so well behaved that very often we can even simplify that model even further. Since the input resistance of the operational amplifier is extremely high and the output resistance of the operational amplifier is extremely low. Another reason for looking at the model of an operational amplifier is that it typifies what we're looking for in a circuit model. The left side of the circuit is the input. Usually when we're looking at the input of a circuit, the property we're most interested in is the resistance seen by anything we connect to it. This is called the input resistance. The right side of the model is the output. It consists of a voltage source in series with the resistance. Remember from the last video, that is the basic model of a real source. When we are looking at the output of a circuit, we are usually interested in what type of source it looks like. We don't just have to look at models of the whole system. If we look at the internal schematic of the operational amplifier again, we notice that there are sections outlined in different colors. Each of these sections is a circuit that performs a specific task. The components outlined in red, for example, can be thought of as current sources. If we wanted to determine how these boxes affected the rest of the circuit, we could model them as ideal current sources in parallel with an equivalent resistance. In fact, no matter which of the outlined sections in the schematic I want to look at, a first order analysis for each section can begin with an equivalent input resistance of that section and the equivalent source that models the output of that section. The section outlined in blue is a differential input, and its model looks just like the model of the overall op amp. This section would have a high input resistance but a low voltage gain. That means it does not make the input signal much bigger. The signal is then passed on to the purplish section. Again, the model of that section would look like the operator amplifier, but it would have a lower input resistance and a very high voltage gain. The green section level shifts and provides some stability. I'll skip that for now. The light blue output section has the same general model as the op amp, but its primary characteristic is to have a very small output resistance. The point is, not only can the whole circuit be made into a model, each individual section can be made into a model depending on our needs for analyzing that particular section. Sometimes we're only interested in what the input side of a particular circuit it looks like, so we determine the equivalent resistance of that circuit. Sometimes we're interested in what type of source a particular circuit looks like, so we determine the equivalent source circuit for that circuit. How do we determine the equivalent resistances of circuits? Sometimes it can be as simple as combining the resistors or doing a few source transformations. Other times it's a bit more involved. The first point we have to agree on is that if two circuits produce the same output voltage and current for all possible values, they are equivalent. Once we agree upon that, we can start developing techniques for simplifying circuits. If I do not make any fundamental changes, changes to a circuit, it must produce the same output. When we looked at the source transformations, we discovered we could change from a voltage source in series with a resistor into a current source in parallel with a resistor without changing the circuit's output at all. With that in mind, let's look at the circuit that we did source transformations on last time. Except this time, instead of worrying about the load resistor, we'll just put a couple of terminals at the output. As long as the circuit we have at the end is the same with respect to those terminals, we'll say we have the same circuit. The left side of the circuit is a voltage source in series with the resistor. That, as we learned in the previous video, can be transformed into a current source in parallel with the resistor. This does not change the behavior of the overall circuit. Once we've done that transformation, we see that there are three resistors in parallel. We can combine these resistors without changing the overall behavior of the circuit with respect to the terminals. Now we have a current source in parallel with a single resistance that can be transformed into a voltage source in series with the same resistance. Still, this does not change the circuit. Now all we have is a voltage source in series with two resistors. Those two resistors can be combined. Now we have a single voltage source in series with a single resistor. This is as simple as a circuit can get. Looking at our original circuit, we made a series of changes that did not change the overall behavior of the circuit from the perspective of the terminal. So the circuit on the right will behave identically to the one on the left, and it is therefore equivalent to the original circuit. This was a very simple path to an equivalent circuit. Not all circuits can be simplified this easily, but we can find an equivalent circuit that has the form of a voltage source in series with a resistor for any circuit. In the next couple of videos, I'll demonstrate a couple of different techniques for finding these equivalent circuits, and I may even be bold enough to give these equivalent circuits a name or two. That's all for today. Go out and make it a great one.